Hello, ladies and gentlemen, computer students everywhere. Welcome back to GIT 335, Computer Systems Technology. I, once again, am your instructor, Nicholas Lindquist. We are here on the ASU Polytechnic campus, and we are geared up for another lecture today on Chapter 9 in your textbook, the final lecture uh, for the semester, The Challenges of the Digital Age, Society, and Information Technology Today. Should be a scorcher, so let's get going. Our topics include, oh, the very interesting topics and themes that we've hit rather hard in this class, security, privacy, and surveillance concerns. Obviously, your instructor has some of those concerns and has tried to impart some of those to you also. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, again in this lecture. And then we have other social, economic, and political issues relating to today's digital environment in which we live and exist. So, security, privacy, and surveillance concerns. Technology is now used to develop predictive search apps, which is actually a little bit creepy, in that um, technology now knows, or at least it's beginning to know, what you want before you know, before you even know what you want. Um, so, my wife is actually kind of like a predictive search app in that she always seems to know what it is I need before I do, and she's only all too willing to point that out for me. Uh, so our apps are becoming uh, equally as smart as my wife these days uh, in that they can guess what you're going to need just based on your previous uh, history uh, in your device, um, the uh, information you've gathered at a specific place before, where you've been, where you are, what you're doing. It's a little bit creepy, for instance. A perfect example is now when I walk into Target, I made the mistake of installing that uh, Redbox cartwheel app on my phone, and now when I walk into Target, uh, my phone pops up and says, hey, I'm going to open the red box or whatever it is, the uh, Target red wheel app now, cartwheel app, because you're in Target. It's like, oh my gosh, that's really scary. Uh, so anyway, just one example. Apps may be getting a little too smart for their own good, but uh, that's not going away. We better get used to that. Security issues, threats to computers and communication systems. So these include errors, accidents, and natural hazards. A human error, as I'm still waiting to commit my first human error, maybe at some point I'll do that, but um, I'm not in any hurry. So a human error, I've heard from other people who have committed them, uh, relates to humans who are often not so good at assessing their own level of information. Um, what's the saying? That uh, a wise man knows that he knows nothing. And so the converse of that is that an idiot has no idea that he's an idiot. Uh, and moving on. Human emotions affect our performance, duh. People get frustrated, duh. Once again, I've never gotten frustrated myself, but I've heard that that is the thing. Maybe you've experienced that, I don't know. Human perceptions may be slower uh, than the equipment, um, especially in this modern era. Uh, information overload may also be a common, uh, may also be a problem. As we said, uh, analysis paralysis. Um, when you're faced with too many possible options, you shut down um, because there's just too much information overload, too many possible choices, does not compute. And then we have procedural errors. When people fail to follow established procedures, errors can occur. No shocker there, right? And then we have software errors, uh, which is a software bug or glitch an error in a program that causes it to not work properly. Uh, so the original um, uh, software bug came from uh, one of the earliest computers, I believe it was uh, ENIAC, um, as we discussed earlier in the semester. Um, the term computer bug came from a program that wasn't running, and when they looked to investigate why, there was a giant moth um, dead in the computer equipment. Uh, and so the term bug, computer bug, has been around ever since then, a giant moth. Uh, dirty data includes the incomplete, outdated, or otherwise inaccurate data, of which there is so, 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 so much out there. Uh, and as you see in the bottom of that slide, GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. This is saying my dad always used to say growing up, garbage in, garbage out. And then finally, we have electromechanical problems, which are hardware problems related to the mechanical systems themselves, wearing out or becoming damaged. They can also be badly designed or constructed, uh, and power failures and surges can lead to damaged equipment, as I'm, not, uh, as I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear. So uh, kind of on the same theme as before, uh, it was last year, I think, we had a massive uh, internet outage here. Um, and what finally they wound up figuring out happened is somehow a mouse had chewed through some cables in the server room at Tempe, and he had been completely scorched and fried. Uh, and as a result of him cooking, uh, we completely lost internet uh, on the Tempe and Polytechnic campus. Uh, so those unpredictable uh, power failures and mouse frying 
Surges can lead to damaged equipment and unpredictability and the realm of information technology. Murphy's Law is in full effect in the realm of information technology. I can assure you that no matter how smart computers get, they are still very, very dumb and they will screw things up. Every single time you think that there's not going to be a technical hiccup, there will be. There will always be a technical hiccup of some sort. Computers are totally unpredictable and they don't even do the same thing over and over and over again. It can be a very, very frustrating industry. Uh, anyhow, we can also have natural hazards that can lead to disasters. I'm sure you're not surprised to learn that. When there is a wildfire, well, I guess computer technology doesn't tend to uh, operate properly in a wildfire. Computer crimes, we have two types of computer crimes. We have a legal act perpetrated against computers. A crime against computers, that's just a sad thing. And then we have a computer involved in a crime, which is a, the using of computers or telecommunications equipment to accomplish an illegal act. The computer is the tool that facilitates that illegal act. So various computer crimes, we can have theft of hardware, theft of software, uh, any of these things you might be able to observe in a Best Buy on a random Sunday afternoon. We have theft of intellectual property, which is piracy. We have music, software, all sorts of different uh, kind of, oh, I'm sorry, thief of, uh, theft of intellectual property, piracy. Uh, no, wait, yeah, that's right. Um, getting privacy and piracy mixed up, yes. Uh, we can have software programs, uh, movies, uh, music, all stolen through piracy. Theft of our time and our services, obviously, theft of information, credit card information, social security numbers, all of those things that can lead to identity theft, internet-related fraud, um, Wi-Fi phishing, as we talked about, uh, war driving, packet sniffing, all those sort of things, crimes of malice, as we said, DDoS, denial of service, um, crashing entire computer systems, and as we also mentioned briefly, those attacks on the power control systems that are a very real um, they're becoming a very real concern in this modern era in that everything is online, including all of that uh, network equipment uh, down at our water plant and or at, or at our energy treatment or water treatment facility or at our energy plant. All of those things are connected to the internet and so they are tar targets for hackers um, who really, really, really want to do cause a bad day for us. Uh, and luckily that hasn't become a serious issue, but there have been tremors uh, that show that that is on the forefront, that is coming. Perhaps you've heard of the, um, it was called the Stuxnet virus uh, that appeared in Iran, I, want, I think it was in 2008 or 2009. Really a horrifying piece of malicious software uh, in that um, once it was finally discovered, we realized that, wow, we're now playing in a much more big and dangerous digital sandbox. Um, so this particular piece of malware had four Microsoft zero-day vulnerabilities, uh, which means that it was completely unknown and unpatched uh, and it was a big shock to Microsoft. If a piece of malware has a single zero-day vulnerability, it is considered a pants-crapping moment for Microsoft and they will drop everything to work on it. Uh, Stuxnet, who was discovered, had four zero-day vulnerabilities. Um, and so the amount of work that must have gone into that, they say, could only have been accomplished by a nation, state, or a government. Uh, anyway, Stuxnet was found installed all over computers in Iran. It was smart enough to know when it was in Iran. Uh, once it was installed on computers in Iran, it was smart enough to work its way into a specific nuclear treatment plant. Uh, this all stemmed from a interview and tour that was given in this energy plant in Iran. And it was photographed that the big dumb computers I told you about on the floor that handle those, um, the rods and the coolers and the whatnot, they run Microsoft Windows 2000 Professional. And so when it was photographed and printed in the paper, uh, it was then made available to hackers. They knew exactly what operating system that they were going to be targeting. Uh, and so it was a huge hole. So Stuxnet got in and over time, slowly uh, clouded the data. And then we brought, um, whenever tests would be made, um, s software checks, whatever, it would return fake information. And eventually, slowly over time, uh, it would destroy the uh, equipment. Uh, and so this whole nuclear reactor uh, through use of uh, software, uh, malicious software was completely shut down and untold millions of dollars uh, were lost by those Iranian nuclear scientists. Uh, and when they did find out um, about Stuxnet being there, they were understandably very ticked off. So that is kind of like uh, the first um, example of what could be a very, very scary future for us um, in that uh, a precedent has been set where it is really possible for um, malicious software to cause serious trouble for our utilities uh, and other very, very important day-to-day uh, -day life on this planet. 
anyway, so crimes of malice, heaven forbid um, that those crimes of malice should actually become more popular on our power control systems, our water treatment plants, and those extremely important utilities. But um, don't be surprised in 10 or 15 years if that is a very, very important issue. Security safeguards, protecting our computers and communications. Security is a system of safeguards for protecting information technology against disasters, system failures, and unauthorized access that can result in damage or loss. Computer security's five components is deterrence to computer crime, identification and access, encryption, protection of software and data, and disaster recovery plans. Uh, those are all the five components of computer security plan. Other detriments to computer crime include enforcing laws. Hmm, that's a no-brainer. Uh, then we have CERT, the Computer Emergency Response Team, which provides around-the-clock information on international computer security threats, uh, and then tools to fight fraudulent and unauthorized online users. Our uses are coming around. We have rule-based detection software. This is basically uh, tools used to trigger an alarm when some kind of risky or uh, shady operation is taking place on the internet. We have predictive statistical model software, uh, hard at work preventing those things. Employee internet management software, basically that means your boss in the form of Big Brother is watching what you do at work. Um, you should be aware that yes, that almost certainly is happening uh, because with computers being the speed that they are, networks being the speed that they are, the amount of data that can be stored uh, in these databases and on these backup systems it's no problem, basically, is what I'm saying, for your boss to monitor every piece of digital or electrical information, um, electronic information that is sent through the interwebs in that company. So you should just expect that, yes, you are being monitored, um, whether or not it's actively monitored or not. Uh, everything that you do is probably going into a repository that your boss could access should he or she ever have an inclination to do that. So please be aware that if you work in a big corporation or perhaps even a smaller corporation, employee internet management software is almost certainly at work. I know that working at ASU, yes, you can actually, uh, so the other day, just out of curiosity for something, obviously I'm not going to illegally download anything at all, and especially not at work, but um, just for some silly reason, I don't even remember what it was, um, I, I surfed to the Pirate Bay to show somebody something, and the page wouldn't even load, and there was a picture of Sparky, and it said, you have no reason to go to this site, or something like that, and I was like, whoa, hey, you know, I certainly wasn't going to, I don't even remember what I was doing, but believe me, it was totally, totally innocent, guys. I got the, the white gloves, I'm innocent. Uh, anyway, uh, internet filtering software um, would be in line with what the uh, NSA uh, might be using with their um, PRISM project or something like that, uh, filtering every little piece of information that travels through the internet. And then we have electronic surveillance, uh, which would be all of those uh, cameras, uh, webcams, uh, whatever. Uh, there's also websites you can go to that will load up uh, all the, uh, just pages full of hundreds of unsecured webcam feeds that it finds. Uh, and then you refresh the page, and then hundreds more from all over the world. I mean, it's interesting. You can see like downtown Russia or something like that. Um, there's some kind of program running behind the scenes at the web page. And when you go to the web page, all it does is just go find you like 50 or 100 unsecured uh, video feeds of electronic surveillance. Uh, and then just group them for your viewing pleasure. And you can refresh and see more. So there's a lot of information out there, guys. <clears throat> Uh, identification and access, um, obviously this is a big one, in verifying your legitimate right to access the information that you have. Uh, as we talked about biometrics being a big part of that. Encryption, we talked about encryption. Protection of software and data. Got to have a disaster recovery plan in the worst case scenario. Um, so basically what happens uh, for the most part is because the idea of being completely stuck without your client's data is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, there should always be what's called a redundant server running at any time that's um, backing up everything, everything that's going on, so that in the event of any kind of a problem, you can immediately switch to the backup server, um, which doesn't cause any loss um, of your client's data uh, or any other um, uptime for your client. A website should be running. It's called the rule of five nines. 99.999% of the time, it is expected that your website will be up and running and operating properly. So should anything go wrong, it is imperative if you are a software as a service provider that you have a disaster recovery plan in place, uh, no matter what, so that there's no lost time and no lost money. Privacy and surveillance. Uh, the rise of big data has led to continuing threats to privacy from three giant sources, business organizations, governments, foreign governments, and criminal groups. 
Yes, all three of these are at work um, when you log on to your computer and go to wherever it is you might be going. Um, you should expect that you are creating data and the databases of all three of those entities. Business and cyber spying, um, hitting on this again, almost everything we do online is being scooped up and recorded for use by marketers. And it's difficult to know what parts of our own lives still belong to us. Uh, and I'm sure some of you are saying right now, well, who cares? They're just trying to market to us. What is the big deal? And that's true. I agree, it might be a little bit annoying, but at the same time, as we discussed, what company is still in business 20 years later, 30 years later? Very, very few companies. So what is happening to that glut of information 5, 10, 15 years down the road when it's no longer being used for marketing? Hmm. Hmm. Certainly it'll still have value. Hmm. So anyway, anyway don't give that stuff away about yourself without at least thinking about the positives and negatives to doing that. So whatever the impact on your personal privacy, it does seem unlikely that you can claim ownership of a lot of data that's being collected about you. Once you submit it to the internet, you are not getting it back. Uh, so at work, for instance, you basically have no rights. I'm sure that's not news to you. I know that at my work I have no rights. Believe me, you students have all the rights. I have no rights. Uh, governments at all levels spy on their citizens. Sometimes encouraged by the law, sometimes in spite of the law, often unknown to us. Interestingly enough, looks like your textbook is going a little bit down the rabbit hole here and speaking about this openly. But uh, so we have the local police, national ID cards, the NSA, the FBI, drones, and so on. Uh, yes, it is not news that we are being snooped and spied on. Uh, and then there's this trade-off between privacy and security, right? We have to walk that fine line, uh, walk between the two pillars. One is privacy, one is security. What is the safe? What is the balance between the two? So we're still trying as a society to find that balance. Spying, hacking, and cyber warfare by foreign governments and groups. Come on, guys. That is just interesting, isn't it? I mean, that's just really interesting to think about that whole world and what's going on way above our heads. So as we said, um, Stuxnet, that super scary virus, uh, was uh, they didn't actually find out for sure who did it, but it is suspected that the United States wrote that uh, with the help of Israel and that they specifically targeted Iran. Uh, so... I wouldn't be surprised. In fact, I'd be surprised if that wasn't the case. We should expect that it's going all directions now, and we're just not hearing about it. It's not being printed in the papers. But spying, hacking, and cyber warfare is the new battleground for foreign governments and hacktivist groups. Changes brought about by technology are not all to the good. As we said in the previous lecture, a new technology that seems like it will free us ultimately handicaps us and restricts us even more, and that we are um, forced to... Um, uphold that new technology and support it, and it restricts us even more. But now let's consider some relevant social, economic, and political issues relating to this topic. Truth issues. Uh, you might be surprised to hear that that image has been manipulated digitally. Uh, so hopefully you're not too shocked and upset. Sometimes we do have to worry about digital information being manipulated or morphed. A big topic about this right now is the issue with male and female body identity and how we feel about ourselves and that when you open a magazine or whatever it may be, we are presented with beautiful, beautiful, beautiful people and those beautiful people have actually been genetically, not genetically, um, digitally enhanced or manipulated to a level that it's not possible for the rest of us to ever attain. Uh, and so we feel bad about ourselves and not even realizing that the people that we want to look like don't even look like that. Uh, so it's a six six cycle. Uh, so pros are it creates new forms of art, uh, digital painting is quite cool, and of course the special effects and whatnot that we see on uh, movies are very, very quite cool. Um, but in cons, uh, news itself can be faked. Wow, I'm impressed. Um, touching on some really risque topics there. Uh, news can be faked. Uh, and it also has recordings, um, sound manipulations, and photographs. Uh, it can no longer be trusted. We have to look and think and hear and think and discern for ourselves. There is a lot of misinformation out there. Quality of life issues, environmental problems. This is absolutely horrifying, guys. Absolutely horrifying. So I read recently that in Shanghai, China, or it was Beijing, I'm sorry, Beijing, China, as you've probably seen, the air quality is so bad. They have to wear masks when they go outside. You can't even see like more than six feet in front of your face. And the worst part of it is recently an eight-year-old girl was diagnosed with lung cancer in Beijing, China, because the air is so bad from those um, technical, from the um, processing um, uh, the manufacturing um, 
plants there and uh, the pollution caused. Uh, so computers, monitors contain chromium, cadmium, lead, mercury, PVC, uh, and other toxic substances that must be disposed of properly. Interestingly enough, the old computers actually contain gold, uh, and so there's actually um, gold. Uh, uh, the old computers, people will actually collect them and then pry out all the old gold from the processors and the chips and the connections and whatnot. Um, so, but the modern ones contain less gold and more crap. And then we have visu visual pollution, which is one that really, frankly, disgusts me. Uh, in that we see those wireless towers wherever we go, and billboards, and smart, um, smart uh, signs, and all the rest of that. Our wildlife and our vegetation are being affected. Mental health problems, uh, in that we all are suffering from some of these new um, digitally brought on problems, including isolation, where if uh, you're a bit of an introvert, uh, you stay home and you substitute online games for interpersonal interaction. Uh, video game and internet addiction is a real thing now. Apparently there was a, t um, a study in uh, Japan that said that uh, people, when they're on social media, Facebook and whatever, the same parts of their brain light up as when people are doing cocaine. Uh, so a little bit scary uh, in that Facebook pushes the same happy buttons as some, um, as some heavy drugs. Uh, many users, and I work with some of these users, find computers stressful and anger inducing. Maybe you actually have coworkers like that who get a little too upset uh, at computers um, when they forget the computers are dumb and we're supposed to be smart. Protecting children. This is another really, really, really creepy one, guys. Uh, it really kind of disgusts and grosses me out. And seeing how we're talking about computers, we might as well talk about this, that um, I read an article uh, at some point within the last year or two that said that I think it's like 70 or 80% of the traffic on the internet is related to pornography. And that is really disgusting. It is such a useful and incredibly, such a profoundly useful tool. Uh, and it's just used for smut. Unfortunately, uh, consenting adults, grown up adults can do whatever the heck they want, but it's a little bit scary in that um, we have to exercise good parenting skills, right? Keep, keep your kids off of the internet, please. So once I'm not gonna tell you how to raise your kids, but when I have kids, they will not be online. They will not. They'll be playing board games and reading magazines, maybe. But uh, it's just, there's just amazing what to what. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll let you read that slide and I'll get down off my soapbox here. Uh, speaking of other horrible things that can be found online, I'm sure you're familiar with um, online sexual predators, thanks to what's that show, Chris Matthews, uh, whatever it is, uh, To Catch a Predator, where he poses as a 14 year old kid and a, a girl in a cyber chat room or something like that, and then arrests the guys when they show up, um, which is, you know, that's. Good and bad, I suppose. Uh, in, in a way, it's kind of entrapment, but in, at the end of the day, I mean, you're getting scum off the street. So uh, it's such an interesting digital world, the things that we have to consider uh, these days. Uh, so obviously, uh, the internet has made it easier for people to target children sexually, which is absolutely disgusting. <sighs> Speaking of awkward slides that I have to talk about, now let's talk about sexting. Sexting is a use of a smartphone or other mobile device to send sexually explicit photos or videos. This is called the uh, Anthony Weiner effect. Uh, sometimes it also refers to sexually charged text messages. Uh, like if you were to text your friend and say, oh, I'm gonna go see Fifty Shades of Grey tomorrow. Oh my gosh, that would be uh, really foul and raunchy sexed. Uh, it can lead to dangerous behavior and embarrassing experiences. Cyberbullying is another real thing that kids these days are, are having to deal with. Uh, it's another really, really good reason for you to monitor your kids' online behavior or online activities uh, because kids can be very, very, very cruel. And kids online can be even more cruel. Just a horribly, horribly sad uh, uh, issue that we're having to confront in our modern society is uh, cyber sex issues and cyberbullying. And uh, it's just. As a society, we're just going to have to learn how to, um, to grow and adapt to meet these new uh, changes and uh, problems. Workplace problems, misuse of technology um, when you're playing online games, shopping, or writing personal emails when you should be working for the boss, for the man. Uh, it's sapping your productivity, productivity and it can get you fired. That's fair warning. Stop misusing the technology at work. Uh, fussing with your computers while you're driving, perhaps, or just in general, can cause a lot of wasted time. And information overload, as we said, with so much information available, people are tending to work more hours and to get swamped by too much information. I yearn for the old days, my friends, uh, where you could go home at five o'clock and not be expected to respond to work text messages or work emails 
and not be chastised uh, when you return to work the next day for not responding to a 9 p.m. email in the middle of the night, you know. Too much information, too much information, and that's going to get worse and not get not better, so we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that too. Information overload was first termed by Albin Toffler in 1970. He predicted that the rapidly, rapidly, rapidly increasing amounts of information would eventually cause people many problems. Uh, so, yeah, duh, you were definitely onto something there, Mr. Albin Toffler in 1970. So although computer processing and memory speed and capacity are increasing all the time, the brain that humans must use to process that information is not getting any faster. So it just makes us feel slower all the time and to feel worse about ourselves because we're being exposed to more information at all times and we're not becoming faster processors of all that data. What are some signs of information overload? Stress, sweaty palms, increased cardiovascular stress, weakened vision, confusion and frustration, judgment impaired based on overconfidence of one's own abilities, and irritation with others owing to the environmental input glut. Uh, so hand that person a Snickers and say, calm down, don't get so upset at the technology. You're not the same when you're hungry. So what can be done about information overload? Well, you can go for a walk, you can go outside, you can go play with your kids. Uh, this slide also suggests things like having quiet, quiet periods, taking breaks, avoiding interruptions. And then we have economic and political issues. A little bit scary in that uh, technology at some point may replace human beings in many jobs. Duh. Technology may affect the gap between the rich and the poor. Hmm. Yeah. Many governments can censor internet content available in their countries, but they can't control all the internet political activism. This is uh, a very hot button subject over in the East. Hypothetically, we don't have any internet um, uh, censorship here, but that's a really, really big deal in China. The internet is only loosely policed, so criminals can take advantage in that deep web. Uh, in that uh, Silk Road, in the whole dark, shadowy corners of the interwebs, all sorts of uh, dark and depraved things happen. Uh, no way around it. Uh, and being able to adapt to technology is critical for people in our modern era. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with a heavy heart that I must report that I am now done lecturing for this class. It has been a real treat to be with you online. I look forward to grading your technical projects. Uh, I very much enjoyed meeting and interacting with each one of you this semester, and I look forward to seeing you online again in the near future. Goodbye.